Chapter 18, Evolution and the Origin of Species. Notice that it doesn't say the origin of life. And we're going to talk a lot in this chapter about what evolution is and what it's not. And I think when, when you hear about what it is and what it's not, it's going to change, I think, the way that you might view it. So depending on what your views are coming into this topic, I want you to just keep an open mind and learn about what the theory is and what it isn't. And I think that's going to change how you see it. So I have a list of objectives. And this chapter is actually quite long because we're going to include three videos. And when you watch the videos, and you can watch them more than once, I would recommend that you watch them more than once because you are responsible for the information in the videos. Not in the sense of every little tiny detail, but the, the main points. You've got to be able to pick out the important statements, the important points that are being expressed in the videos. So, but this, these study objectives are going to be very much how I make the chapter quiz and how I make the questions for the final exam. So these are really critical for you in studying. So we're going to start off with a little story, I guess. Um, you've probably heard of Charles Darwin. He was the son of uh, Erasmus Darwin, who was wealthy and famous uh, in his own right. And he, his son, Charles, um, went to medical school but didn't become a doctor, went to seminary but didn't become a priest or a clergyman. And so Darwin ended up taking an unpaid internship, I guess you could call it, aboard a ship called the Beagle. And the Beagle was to sail around the world. And the um, captain of the Beagle needed an educated dinner companion. And so Darwin was really the dinner companion and um, the unpaid naturalist on the Beagle. Naturalist, like biologist. So he was allowed to get off at the stops and collect samples and specimens. And he traveled around the world. It was a five-year voyage. And it turns out he and the captain didn't like each other at all. And um, so I'm sure that made for a really fun five-year voyage. But in any case, he made a lot of observations and collected specimens, a lot of birds that he brought back to England after the five years was up. And he spent, um, he, he really paid attention when he was at various islands, especially the Galapagos Islands became very important as he looked at his data. Another scientist, another naturalist, um, a younger guy uh, compared to Darwin is Alfred w Russell Wallace, who went to Malaysia and spent time in Malaysia and actually looked at a lot of birds, which Darwin looked at a lot of different birds as well. And by studying the birds, they um, both men were, were ruminating on this concept that eventually became what we now know as natural selection. So, so one thing you may think is that Darwin came up with the idea of evolution, and that's incorrect. Evolution was already a concept at that time. Um, a guy who was older than Darwin named Lamarck, for example, um, had um, a theory of how evolution happened. So they were looking for not, not the concept of evolution. That wasn't new. What they were looking for was what we call the mechanism of evolution. And so what causes evolution to happen? So what Darwin did was proposed a mechanism of evolution. And not he didn't propose the concept of evolution itself, because that already existed. Now, evolution itself is the idea that species change over time. 
And so the mechanism of evolution means what causes species to change over time. And so Darwin and also Wallace proposed the mechanism that we now call natural selection. So it's really probably a surprise, at least to some of you, Darwin did not propose evolution. He proposed a mechanism to explain evolution, which became known as natural selection. Now, Wallace came up with the same idea of natural selection. In fact, Wallace wrote a letter to Darwin and sent him his, his draft of his paper that he was writing. And Darwin had not published not really anything significant in the 20 years that had passed since he came back from his trip on the Beagle. And Wallace the Younger, um, naturalist, sent him this draft and asked for his opinion. And Darwin realized that if Wallace published, he would be the one that got credit for this concept of natural selection. So Darwin, who had been fiddling around for 20 years, decided to go ahead and publish at the same time. It was not an easy decision. In fact, the reason Darwin hadn't published in that 20-year span was that he knew that what he was about to propose was going to have some major conflicts with the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Um, the Pro well, Protestant Church depends on the sex, but um, the Catholic Church had certain views of how old the earth must be and how life, um, that life had never changed. It had been created exactly in the form that it is in now. And so those views at the time would be in conflict with, with Darwin's views. And he knew that people he knew and people in his circle would be very angry, that the church would be angry. But in, in any case, when he saw the draft that Wallace had sent him, he knew that he also had to publish at the same time. So Darwin and Wallace published their concepts at the same time. And of course, Darwin being the older and the more well-known um, is the one who ended up getting really the credit. So Wallace got the short end of the stick. So really what Darwin proposed has I would call them the three principles or the three parts of natural selection. And this is from your textbook. If we were together in class, I would have you read through this and boil this down to the three principles of natural selection. And when you read through this, you can find them, but I am going to summarize them for you on the next slide. So one of the first concepts or the first rule I guess you could call of natural selection is there must be genetic variation in the population. Different alleles. Now fortunately mutation takes care of this for the most part. It's very hard to find a population that doesn't have genetic variation. So DNA polymerase makes mistakes when it replicates the, the DNA, and then you also have induced mutations that happen um, through UV light and other kinds of mutagens in the environment. And, and so genetic variation is, is typically um, is going to be in, in most populations. Number two is there has to be some competition for resources, or for survival, or for mates. Competition, it's hard to write with a mouse. Competition for resources, competition for survival, competition for mates, M-A-T-E-S. And so that competition is important. If you have a scenario where there's no competition, then natural selection won't be, won't be functioning in that situation. And number three, they, there have to be some genetic variants, we'll call them some phenotypes, some genotypes that are favored in the competition and some that are not favored. We'll focus on the favored. Some um, variants that are favored and they're more likely to pass their those alleles on to the next generation so that over time the 
the variants that are favored are more uh, appear more often in the next generation and so on and so forth. And so these are the, the basic requirements of natural selection. There has to be variation in the population, there has to be competition, and if some um, variants are favored, they will be represented more often in the next generation. Now keep in mind that natural selection is not a guarantee. It does tend to lead to adaptation, but I want you to realize that in evolution there's a lot of extinction, meaning there's a lot of cases where you have um, something in the environment that changes and nobody's favored and everybody dies. So extinction is much more common than adaptation. But when adaptation happens, it has to really follow this, this kind of three-step process, I guess you could say. The other thing is the organisms don't decide to have genetic variation. Like you, you can't just decide, okay, I want to be born with brown fur. Or it would be better if I could have longer legs. Nobody gets to choose. You're born with whatever you're born with. And Mother Nature, the scenario in, in that environment, decides what's favored and what's not. So if you live in the Arctic, having white fur is favored. But if you live in a forest, in a, in a jungle, having white fur is probably going to stand out and attract predators. So every scenario decides what is favored and what isn't. Every predator decides. So you can't try to adapt. You either have the favored trait or you don't. And if you have the favored trait and it is genetic in nature, then you can, you're can you more likely to survive and pass that allele on to the next generation. And again, it's more likely, it's again not a guarantee, but more likely. So when adaptation happens, it happens over many generations, and what it really is is a shift in the genetic structure of the population to where more of the individuals have the favored alleles. One individual cannot adapt. That is a slang use of the term adapt, but we're not using the slang term of adapt. We're talking about the whole population adapts. That's the scientific way of thinking of it, the group. It's always about the group. So Darwin, like I said, he studied the, um, the birds, and he studied a lot of things. But honestly, you, you need to realize that he was not an ornithologist. He was not an expert in birds. So he collected a lot of things. He had a lot of ideas. But when he went back to England after five years, he consulted with experts, which is a good example of how in science we are always collaborative. I am not an expert in everything, therefore I rely on experts to help me fill in pieces that I need. So he needed to know about these birds and he had an ornithologist that helped him. But you don't have to be an ornithologist to see that the birds that he collected, they have different beak shapes. So it makes a good teaching tool and you can see that the different beaks, as he observed the birds getting their food from different sources, he noticed that the beak shape seemed to match whatever the source of food was. So a bird with a long pointy beak might be getting worms out of a hole in the bark of a tree, and a bird with a big thick beak might be cracking nuts. And so the tool, the beak, matched the job of getting food. And so those are adaptations that would have been favored or selected over time in the group. So one of the first uh, videos that I'm going to ask you to watch is this one. It's um, narrated by Sean Carroll and he narrates a lot of the HHMI videos. HHMI stands for Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It's a very well-funded um, institute in the United States and it actually funds a lot of research like at UT Southwestern and such and their website is really well done and you know very reliable um, and so you're gonna watch this it's called the making of um, the fittest and it's the story of the rock pocket mouse 
and you want to take notes and really understand what this story is. Now this story is about adaptation within a population. No new species are created in this story, but the population, the genetic structure for the color of the fur changed over time due to changes in the environment. So you want to look at that. Now evidence of evolution, this is um, Again, you, you almost have to be an expert in a particular field to, to be able to, to judge the different evidences. Certainly, some evidence of evolution that we find are fossils. And fossils can be bones. They can be shells or things that are hard on the body that don't decay as quickly. And they can also just be imprints like an imprint of a shell in the sedimentary rock or an imprint. And there's even microfossils, like they can find fossilized pollen grains or imprints of pollen grains. I mean, it's, again, you, you know, there are experts who, who specialize in each of these um, things, but fossils are definitely some of the evidence of evolution. We can also look at existing organisms and fossils when we have them and look at comparative anatomy. So looking at structures, seeing if they're similar or different. Sometimes this can be misleading as we will talk about later, um, but when, when structures are similar, it might be true that they came from an ancestor, a common ancestor that also had that structure. So. The human arm is a good example because you don't, again, you don't have to be an expert in bone anatomy to, to see the, the relationship between the um, limb structure of the human. So you have humerus, radius, ulna, then you have the um, small hands of the, small bones of the hand. And you can see even in the whale, you have a thicker bone, but a single bone, radius, or sorry, humerus, radius, ulna and then the small bones of the hand, and modified to some extent in the bird. But you can see that commonality, and it turns out that the common ancestor of all of these mammals had an arm structure that had one bone, which we would call the humerus, then two bones, radius and ulna, then small bones and finger bones. And so sometimes we can find those fossils of those common ancestors, and it helps to explain why all the modern organisms that are related to that common ancestor also have that similar structure. And when, when structures are related to each other because they're related to a common ancestor, we call those structures homologous. And homologous structures helps us to understand relationships. I will mention, though, that we're going to talk about and one of the caveats is you can't just always assume that structures are homologous. Even if they look similar, you have to be able to find evidence of an ancestor that also had that similar structure. Because there are cases where structures appear to be similar, but in, in, in the end, the ancestors, um, they're very distantly related and they don't have those structures. Another thing that really feeds into our explanation of, um, of evolution is this concept of adaptation. There's a misconception that adaptation always makes an organism better or almost a, an idea that it makes it perfect. But it only an adaptation is only good in that environment in which it evolves. So an adaptation that's good in one environment might not be good in another environment. Again, I use the example of the white fur or the white feathers in the Arctic, but in a different environment that might, would not be a good adaptation. So every adaptation is um, good for, that, that arises by natural selection, is good for that environment at that time, but not all environments all the time. So there are limitations. So there are, in your textbook, misconceptions of evolution. And I'm going to let you dig into that a little bit. And I will have um, 
during one of our early meetups. We will go over the misconceptions. If you can't come to the meetup, then you can watch the recording later. So misconceptions of evolution, that's a big thing that we're going to need some time to talk about. All right, biological species. So if evolution creates a genetic shift within a species and then over time enough of those build up to where there's a whole new species, if you have enough genes that have changed, you get a whole new species, then as humans, we have to come up with a definition of what is a species. What def what, how do we know when there's enough differences to create a new species? Um, and so there is a definition, it's called the biological species definition, and it goes like this. Two organisms belong to the same species if they can and will mate and produce a fertile and viable offspring. Viable means it survives and it can also, it can reproduce. So for example, when you look at dogs, there's a lot of different dogs, but they're all the same species because they can produce um, a fertile, viable offspring. So here's a poodle and here's, uh, I think this is a cocker spaniel. And so this is a cockapoo, which is perfectly fertile and viable. Um, if they're if the dog species became so different from each other, excuse me, not dog species, if the dog breeds eventually became so different from each other that they could not produce fertile viable offspring, then at that point we would say they've become different species. So far that hasn't happened, but as we keep different dogs separated and, and create these pure breeds, which has been done by human artificial selection. It's possible that eventually that some of the breeds would not be able to mate with others. I, we, I don't have any evidence that that's happened yet, but that could happen. And just because two things look the same doesn't mean they're in the same species. So looks can be deceiving. So these two, this is an African fish eagle on the left and a bald eagle on the right. To me, they look exactly the same, but it turns out, and I'll trust your book on this, they're different species. So the only way you would know is that you would look for evidence that they have ever produced fertile viable offspring together, and they don't. And so that for that reason, they're defined as separate species. So they can look a lot alike and still be different species. They can also look very different, like the dog breeds, and still be the same species. So it's not like you can't just know whether two things are in the same species or not. You have to apply the definition. You have to look for evidence that they have produced fertile, fertile viable offspring together. If yes, then they're the same species. If no, then they're different species. Even Darwin thought about species. He has a drawing in his um, first publication on the origin of species by means of natural selection. That's the full title. And he shows a diagram. The diagram is on the left. He's thinking about how things branch off from other things. And this is similar to the way we now draw what we call cladograms or evolutionary trees. So the one on the right is not drawn by Darwin. But Darwin had this concept in his in his notebooks. So we're going to learn, I, it's in chapter 20, we'll learn how to not only create these trees from data, but also to read the data. But this is a, a cladogram or an evolutionary tree, and the one of the concepts of the evolutionary tree is that um, one of the axes, you have the x-axis and the y-axis, one of the axes has to be time. And like in this case, the, the top here is present day. And as you go down, you're going back in time. So in this case, it's the, it's the vertical axis that's time. And so there's, on the evolutionary tree, the tips of the branches represent present day. I'm going to put PD. And then whatever's down here is way back in time. 
And the paleomastodon, that might be the beginning of this little section of this tree, but this paleomastodon ties into the larger evolutionary tree of life. And so this continues to go back in time, but the concept is that the tips of the branches are present day and that on one of the axes you're going back in time. Sometimes they draw the tree on the horizontal and then the paleomastodon, for example, could be at the far left and the modern day elephants could be on the far right. In that case, the x-axis would be time. So it doesn't matter which way they draw it. But this concept of, as you go back in time, things that are now different species connect to a common ancestor. So where the two lines meet, like if you backtrack on this Asian elephant and you backtrack on this African elephant, there is a common ancestor that lived at some point in history, whatever time that is, but then it split into two species. And now what we have on Earth are two different species, but there is a common ancestor. So we talk about the common ancestor, it's whatever animal would be at this point. So it's probably something similar to this guy here. So this concept of the common ancestry um, is shown in Darwin's writings too. All right, now there's a couple ways that speciation can happen. Allopatric speciation is probably not only the easiest one to understand, but probably the most common way that speciation happens. And it's simply when you have one group, one type of owl, let's say, and way back in time, and then it part of the group maybe migrated to a different area, and so the group was split geographically, and then over time each group evolved differently. So changes happened, different predators, different things were favored in this population that's here, sort of in the southwest U.S. and down into Mexico. And then other climates and predators were influencing the population that was up here in the Pacific Northwest. And so over time, what we see today are two different species that have adapted separately to two different environments, but they share a common ancestor. So there would have to be data, which is not shown here, but data that shows that these two um, both evolved from a con one single type of owl ancestor. And I don't, I don't ever mean like one single owl. I mean like one population of owl. Adaptive radiation is just a special term where you have, where you seem to have one ancestor that has broken off many times and you end up with more than two species. So it's kind of like allopatric speciation. It is allopatric speciation that's happening multiple times from one ancestor. So on the tree, on the evolutionary tree, instead of having one common ancestor and then two species, it would be like more than two, in this case, six. So, so it's really just an allopatric speciation on steroids. This happens on islands a lot because when you have islands, there's just a natural geographic separation that the water creates. And so like if you have a bird that populates one island and then a small group goes over to another island and they populate, now you have birds on two islands. But if they're separated enough by the water, they might build up different um, changes, different adaptations over time and to a point where they eventually become two separate species. And then the same thing in a similar way happening to this island and this island and eventually end up with, in this case, six different species of finch. Oh, this is honey creeper, sorry. On the Galapagos Islands, it was finch. So I want you to watch this video and there is a transcript, um, sometimes um, David Wake is a little bit hard to understand, but this video shows allopatric speciation, just a perfect example of what I've just explained to you and gives you a, a really concrete example of allopatric speciation with what we call the Picta salamanders. Picta is the really the, the breed, I guess you could call it, of salamanders. 
So you're going to watch that video and take really good notes so that you can explain how this is an example of allopatric speciation. Sympatric speciation is where sympatric means in the same location. So allopatric means one group splits to two different locations and then they become different over time. Sympatric is where a, species, a new species appears in the same location as the ancestral species. The best examples of these are in plants. Um, it, it's because plants can do some weird stuff. Plants can what we call hybridize and animals can hybridize as well like one species of wheat and another species of wheat can produce an offspring that we call the hybrid. And in, in animals, this would be like a horse and a donkey make a mule. But the thing about it is, in the animal kingdom, the mule is not fertile. And therefore, a horse and a donkey stay as separate species. But in the plant kingdom, a horse and a donkey, well, this wheat and this wheat can make a hybrid wheat. And then plants can do something that animals um, don't tend to do, which is they can do what's called a chromosomal doubling event, which makes the infertile hybrid become fertile. And that step right there, the chromosomal doubling event, is something that doesn't happen in the animal kingdom and therefore in plants though it's reasonably common. I, I mean it's rare but it's it happens enough to where you can see some examples of this and this creates a new species so this species is literally a fertile hybrid of these two separate species and they've done a lot of this kinds of thing in, with crop plants. However, this example with the wheat happened naturally. But in the lab, you can speed up the process. But anyway, this wheat was a, high, a fertile hybrid of these other two, and it would be considered a, a third species. If this one is one species, this is a different species, then this would be a third species, and it would appear in the same field that the other ones are already in. And so that's why it's sympatric, because it's a new species appearing in the same place as the other species. So it's a little bit different way of thinking about it. But plants are where you typically see sympatric speciation. There are some examples of sympatric speciation, um, like one example is with fish, but it's where the fish start to um, self-select their mates, so I would call it, it's a mate selection, where in this example you have some cichlids that are all the same species and, and originally, and some of them have thin lips and some of them have thick lips in this example. This is a real example. Um, there's also some examples of fish that have different colorations. But whatever the, the physical trait is, for whatever reason, some of the fish start to select a mate that only has a certain appearance. So let's say if the thin-lipped cichlids only mate with other thin-lipped cichlids, and the thick-lipped cichlids only mate with thick-lipped cichlids, cichlids, then what will happen is, even though they're all swimming together in the same lake, they will reproductively isolate themselves because they're choosing mates based on appearance. And, it, and so you'll end up with a population that's only, um, that's staying reproductively separated from the other. So it's really where the animal decides not to mate with the other in a, in a way. But it's harder to find examples of um, sympatric speciation um, in, in the animal kingdom. In the plant kingdom, it's much easier. So here's the question, why do some species, why do, what prevents two species or two organisms from breeding and producing fertile viable offspring? Um, and the answer is always a reproductive barrier, all right? So a reproductive barrier, like the one I just showed you with the cichlids is behavioral, because like the thick lipped cichlids and the thin lipped cichlids just behave, they choose not to 
mate. So that could be considered behavioral. Um, but there always is some kind of barrier that you can find that, that explains why the two groups are different species. And usually you can find more than one barrier. So for example, there's different barriers. One is temporal. So any barrier that has to do with reproductive timing, like let's say one group is fertile in the spring and the other group is fertile in the fall, then they can't reproduce with each other because the reproductive timing is not, not matched up. Another one is called habitat, or sometimes I've heard it called ecological, but your book calls it habitat, so we'll stick with that. And that has to do with where the animal lives. Like, is it aquatic? If it's an aquatic animal, and let's say you have an aquatic frog and a land frog, they might not mate just because they're living in different types of habitats. Simple. Mechanical is, it has to do with the actual anatomy of the reproduction system. Like, there's some frogs where the way the male and the female copulate, it has to the parts have to fit together correctly to stimulate the female and so if you have a frog of a different species it might it won't stimulate the female in the right place and so then she won't lay the eggs so anything where the parts don't fit together or things don't match up so that the gametes can't be delivered that's called mechanical behavioral that's limited to animals because there has to be some kind of choice or decision, even if it's instinctual, it's some kind of behavior that's causing organ, uh, animals to not mate or to mate with each other, depending. And then the one that's really the strongest is this one here, the incompatible gametes. Because most of the time, if, um, let's say you, you force two animals to mate, I don't know how you do it, but you force them to mate, even if you deliver eggs uh, you deliver the sperm to the eggs. If the if the biochemical molecules, I'm talking about like the glycoproteins on the surface of the egg and the sperm, if those molecules don't match up, then the gametes won't fuse. They'll just bounce off of each other. That's probably a good thing because you know somebody would be in their garage trying to create some kind of weird hybrid uh, in a test tube but they, they won't work because the gametes won't fuse. So, you know, sometimes um, when you put animals together, like in a zoo, sometimes under stress, animals will behave weirdly, like try to mate with each other when they really, they're not the same species. But um, this will prevent them from, you know, the, the, there won't be any conception. And there won't be any chemical recognition of the egg and the sperm if they're different species. But there are some animals and plants that can, um, can produce a zygote. And that's what these terms mean. Prezygotic is something that prevents the formation of the zygote. Postzygotic is a barrier that stops the um, hybrid after it forms. So postzygotic means a barrier that comes after the zygote. So let's say the zygote forms. Let's say that all none of these barriers are here and the zygote forms. So the example of this is the mule, right? Because the mule has a, um, a horse and a donkey for parents and they're fertile at the same time. They often live in the same habitat. The, the mechanics of copulation are, work just fine. They're attracted to each other, they have the right behaviors, and their gametes are compatible. But when the mule is born, it's perfectly viable. So it's, it's a viable hybrid, but it's not fertile. So because it's infertile, that means that horse and donkey are different species. And the mule is referred to as a hybrid. So I give you some examples here. Rana is um, the genus name for frog. So you have uh, Rana aurora and Rana boili, and they're just, um, their breeding, their period when they're fertile is different. So they will never be able to breed together. That's a temporal prezygotic barrier. 
A habitat barrier can be, like I said, anything that has to do with where they live in the habitat. In this example, you've got a cricket that likes the sandy soil, another cricket that likes the loamy soil, which is more um, less sandy. And um, but it could be anything. It could be a snake that lives in the in the water and a snake that lives on land. It could be anything like that. Something that lives birds that live in the trees versus birds that live more on the ground. So that's a habitat barrier. Mechanical barrier is this is I think this is a weird picture, but um, these are the reproductive organs of different damselflies, male damselflies. And you can see they're different, so only the right organ will deliver the sperm to the correct female. So this one's also mechanical, where you have a pollinator. Certain flowers use certain pollinators, so only a, a certain insect can enter the flower, and um, if the wrong insect goes in, it won't deliver the pollen to the other flowers. So that's a mechanical issue. All right, so which barrier? I want you to, to pause this. If you really want to test yourself, pause this and read these through and see if you can tell which barrier is acting. All right, I'm going to give you the answers. So the first one, lions and tigers overrange their, um, or overlap their range in India. They do not mate in nature. So the first part of this is describing what kind of barrier. This first one would be a habitat. They just usually don't meet up. Now, in captivity, they will, under stress, mate, but the offspring is sterile. That's a postzygotic barrier that's called infertile hybrid. Infertile. So that one kind of has two answers. The same thing happens with like a liger that has a lion and a tiger for parents. That's a sterile hybrid. Okay, um, two species of wild lettuce. One flowers in the spring, the other in the summer. And flowers, by the way, are reproductive structures, eggs and sperm. So this would be temporal, having to do with timing. Bees may carry the pollen of one plant species on a certain place in their body. If this area does not come into contact with receptive structures on flowers of another plant, the pollen is not transferred. That's mechanical. And the last one, animals that shed gametes directly into water. Eggs and sperm from different species will not fuse. That's incompatible gametes. Incompatible gametes. So I'm just giving you some examples of what I would expect you to be able to recognize. I'll give you a little, a little blurb, and you're telling me what, what, uh, what it appears that this is describing in terms of the barriers. All right, blue-footed boobies. You have got to watch the blue-footed boobies. This is the mating dance of the blue-footed booby. I'm going to play a little bit of it. And basically, they have these blue feet, and they lift them up and show them to each other. And he's saying, look at my feet, look at my feet. Are you looking at my feet? He wants to climb, he wants to um, mount. Holy cow. Oh my gosh, watch this, watch this. Wow. Carla. And that's it, he did it. Wow. Ah, ah. Now 
that was quick. The mating is very quick. Okay, so look at my feet, look at my feet. Now, albatross is also in the same location, and these were both shot in the Galapagos Islands, but albatross has a different dance. See if you can figure it out. Some little quail size. Oh, yes. Oh, baby. <laughs> Okay, so you can see the difference in the mating um, dance. So the blue-footed booby shows the male shows the female his feet. It does turn out that the one with the more blue feet will get more females. It's, the females like a really good blue foot. The albatross does this sort of beak sword fight. And so if you had a male blue-footed booby and a female albatross, they wouldn't mate because the male blue-footed booby would be showing his feet and the female wants to, the female albatross wants to sword fight. So these are some um, other hybrids, sterile hybrids, um, that I wanted to show you. This thing is called a zonkey. It's a zebra and a donkey hybrid. Um, you, you know what a mule is. A mule has a donkey for a father and a horse for a mother. But there's also something called a hinny that has a horse for a father and a donkey for a mother. And it looks a little bit different. This one is called the Zetland Zoni. It's a Shetland pony, which is really just a horse, but a, a particular breed. And then a zebra. And so you can cross these equius. Equius is the, the horse family, but it includes uh, also donkey and zebra. And so um, just kind of like the cats, in the cat family, you also have sterile hybrids, the liger, the tigon, and some other, um, some wild cats can mate with um, domesticated house cats, and they can produce these sterile hybrids. So once speciation has happened, once you have these barriers that are preventing successful reproduction of a fertile viable um, offspring, there's really three things that can happen because when you first, when a group starts to split, um, the two groups are separate, but they're still pretty closely related. And typically what happens is either you'll end up with more and more differences over time, that's called reinforcement, or it's possible in the early stage that they can, that the two groups will just fuse back together and become one species again. Those are really the two things. There are some examples where you have two groups and the hybrids which are being produced, although in my opinion, in that case, you don't really have true speciation because if the hybrids are, are fit, if they're able to reproduce fertile viable offspring, then this is not even different species. I would focus on these two because I'm not going to ask you about stability anyway, because I don't believe it's really a thing. So reinforcement is where the group splits and just continues to become more and more different, or the group splits, but in the very early stage, it just starts to merge back together again, and you end up with one species again. Those two things can happen. So you... You watch the video with David Wake and the Picta salamanders, and those salamanders are at a very, very early stage of speciation, and so it's possible that if they start mating together more and more and more, it could just fuse back into one species, or it could keep going in the direction it's moving and become two different species. It's too early to tell, because either one is possible. The last topic in the chapter is the speed of evolution. When Darwin um, published The Origin of Species, he was really showing that natural selection would create very slow, gradual change. So the, the 
genetic structure of a population shifts a little bit in each generation, and then eventually there's enough difference to create a new species, but initially the two species are very similar, and then they keep becoming more and more different, very general. So we say species diverge slowly. Diverge means become more different. However, in the 1970s, two uh, evolutionary biologists, Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, proposed something called punctuated equilibrium, which actually, in the fossil record, there's definitely examples of this. And that's where what we see in the fossil record is change that happens very quickly. So um, punctuated equilibrium shows where it is an example where some species changes quickly and then kind of stays similar for a while. And then maybe, and, and these can, these are both correct. Some parts of the evolutionary tree have gradualism. The change is happening on that branch very slowly. And then maybe as that branch goes on, there's some parts where change happens quickly. Uh, and so you can have periods of punctuated equilibrium for one, you know, if you're tracing the history of one particular bird, in some of the ancestors there might have been change that was very gradual, and then you might get to a point where there's a change that happens quickly. And so both of them are, are possible. It's just that before the 1970s, everybody thought that it had to be slow. And now we know there's really a possibility in some parts of the evolutionary tree for the change to happen quickly. It has everything to do with what's happening in the environment at that time. Um, and we're going to talk about um, how change happened very quickly when the dinosaurs went extinct. And so that would be, you know, an a environmental change that made things happen very quickly. Um, but in other cases, the change happens very slowly. The last video that you're going to watch is a really interesting concept. And by the way, this does not, the guy, uh, Ken Dial, who's in the video, he doesn't solve the problem. The problem is there was always, and there still is, um, an argument to evolution by natural selection that says, how can something complicated evolve by evolution? Because if you have a structure like the eye or a wing, there's actually a lot of anatomy that makes that work. You know, if you know the eye has lots of parts, has lots of different cell types, and they all work together to create an image. So evolution, adaptation would say that there had to have been the very first part of an eye had to evolve, and then another little part, and then another little part. And each little part that evolves has to be favored. But the question is, what good would a little bit of an eye be? Why would that be favored? Why would a little bit of a wing even be favored? And so what Ken Dial's research does is it creates some hypotheses, or it adds on to some of the hypotheses and thinking about how complex traits evolve. So it doesn't solve the problem, but it adds a new idea. And so what you're looking for in this video is what is the new idea that Ken Dial came up with to answer the question, what good is half a wing? What good is a little bit of an eye? Why would that be selected? And this is the video. And I also have the link and the transcript. Um, and this is also an HHMI video. Um, All right, so that's the end of your first lecture. I hope you took good notes. Watch the videos. You can take good notes on the videos or print out the transcripts and make highlights. And make sure you understand the gist of the videos and what, what they're telling you um, about evolution.